नमस्कार व्यूवर्स वेलकम टू दिस फर्स्ट लेक्चर फॉर द कोर्स ऑन इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी इन दिस फर्स्ट लेक्चर आई विल बी इंट्रोड्यूसिंग टू यू द बेसिक्स ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी एज वी मूव अहेड इन अदर लेक्चर्स वी लुक एट अदर आस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी बट द प्रजेंट लेक्चर इज फोकस्ड ऑन introducing the concept of using psychology in engineering now the term engineering psychology can be misperceived engineering psychology has very less to do with engineering per se but what it comprises of is engineering the principles of psychology in such a way that it fits problems in engineering and natural sciences and helps in designing systems that tend to benefit and complement the human user so let's start this introduction with an example last year we had a train accident in orissa two trains collided with each other one was stationary and the other was coming at a good speed the time of the accident was night and one of the trains was a passenger train the accident led to loss of lives not only of the pilot of the locomotive but also a number of passengers an inquiry was done and the reports of the inquiry are still not in the public domain but from what it seems a misreading on the part of the train engineer led to the accident in this particular case it was misreading the visual display or the visual signal because of which the pilot of the passenger train speeded up and some failure from the station manager led to both the trains coming on the same track this could have been easily avoided by using the principles of human engineering let's take another example you have often seen automatic doors recently i was at one of a famous malls and it had these automatic glass doors which are run by sensors now as is evident with me, most malls children have a lot of fun and some children were playing these doors picked up movement and based on these movement it closed one of the children did not realize that the door was automatically operated he rushed towards the door the sensor somehow could not detect motion and remained closed and the child banged into the door he was hurt and taken to the hospital again this problem could have been very easily avoided by using the principles of human engineering these two examples in my opinion are sufficient to suggest how the principles of psychology can be engineered into solving human machine interactions and making these interactions more fruitful so let's start by first defining what human engineering or human factors actually mean 
So by definition, human factors is the application of psychological science to the design of environments that fit the capabilities and limitations of the human user. This is a very brief and narrow description of human factor engineering, but it covers in essence what is the principal aim of engineering psychology. What it says is that the science of engineering psychology uses principles of experimental psychology and cognitive psychology, then looks at the limitations and capabilities of users and systems and based on that help us design ways of interaction between the user and the system so that the interaction between the two is fruitful and efficient. Going back to the example of the glass door which I was referring a while ago. If visual signs would have been put on the door either written or in terms of picture which would have described that these doors are automatic or you which would caution you not to cross these doors directly, but wait for the sensor to open the door, the children would not have been hurt. So, these kind of information learning can be used to design environments which are safe for interaction between the user and the machine. So, what does human factor engineering study include? I have named three different aspects. The study of human psych engineering psychology includes the study of human cognitive abilities and limitations. It also includes the study of human physical activities, abilities and limitations and the design of devices, environments and systems for human use. Let us take this one by one, human cognitive abilities and limitations. These will cover all cognitive abilities which humans have, the ability of perception, the ability of attention, problem solving, decision making, thinking to name a few. An example here could be the design of casinos. So, how do these gambling houses work and what it can learn from the psychology of decision making? The first thing that it can learn is that most humans are impulsive and they prefer smaller rewards over larger rewards. Also there are relations between how personality and reward taking or risk taking are related. Other simple examples could be the attention span and the memory span of users. Most users of any machine or system have a limited memory span. So, 
designing websites or designing systems which give you limited information would help in making the user interact in a better way with a system. The second factor here is physical abilities and limitations. What we have to realize as engineering psychologists is that humans have limited physical activity and ability. There are certain actions that humans can do and which fall within the physical limits of users. There are certain feats they can achieve and certain feats that is impossible. Turning 180 degree towards one side or making both the hands move or make motion in opposite directions are something which are not permitted by the physical limitations of the human user. So, those controls which require humans to use these abilities would actually fail. Look at the typical car. It has three controls, but the humans have only two legs. And this is the best example that I can think of because with two legs of the operator, three controls have to be operated. And because of this, you would see a number of times accidents occur. So, at best, two legs could control two levers or two possible actions. The third includes the design of devices, environments and systems for human use. Devices are available to help humans. The design of any device, whether it is the interface or the control of a device should be made in such an intuitive way that the operator understands it various states. For example, look at printers. The on and off switch of the printer should be designed in such a way that off would be signaled by a non-lit state, meaning that the switch has no light, whereas the on should be explicitly indicated by a light. This makes the user interact with machines in an easy way. Environments can also be designed in such a way that it helps the operators and the users in interacting with it. The use of environment supplements help users perform actions in a better way. And certain systems should also be designed in ways which help the users interact with it in a beneficial way. So then, human factor engineering or, human or engineering psychology per se includes the study of these three main uh, factors or variables. So, while defining the definition of human factor engineering, which is if I redefine human factors in terms especially for psychology, the definition would run as human factor is an area of applied psychology, the knowledge of which 
is used to design the environment to fit the limitations and capabilities of the human user. Here too it is the same definition or more or less similar definition, but you might ask me why I needed this new definition. Human factor engineering is a large body of knowledge and it borrows knowledge from various disciplines including computer science, biology, psychology, mathematics, data sciences, engineering sciences and so a number of areas contribute to the human factor engineering or ergonomics discipline. Psychology is one of these disciplines which contribute to the human factors. As this course is dedicated to the study of engineering psychology which is looking at human factor problems from the psychological point of view this definition was needed. As a psychologist we would focus on how human factor problems or man machine problems are studied and resolved using principles of psychology and within this we will study the physiological, the cognitive and the physical capacity of humans and also the design of human machine environments. Now, the definition that I have just defined talks about environments, the design of environments. What is an environment? Let us try and understand environments which has been defined in the definition. I just put forward includes the social environment and the physical environment. So, when designing environments, two kinds of environments should be looked into. What is the physical environment or the physical aspect of environment? Physical aspects of environment include things that people or operators can sense. For example, sounds, visual information, motion, space. So, when designing environments under which humans and machines are interacting, these facts should be considered. Let us take an example, sound. Now, generally there are two type of sounds in the particular engineering psychology discipline. One is the signal and the other is the noise. Whereas, the signal is that sound which the operator is looking for in the environment because that will define further action. Noise is something which interferes with the signal. The study of how noises can be controlled or how signals can be detected efficiently in a noisy environment will help us design environments in such a way that signals can be efficiently picked up by the user. So, this is how the physical aspect of an environment can be defined. What is the social aspect of an environment? 
the social aspect of the environment will include conditions of situations that give us the sense that we should act in a particular way. Now, environment as such has a physical part which can be sensed and which is more apparent, which is more covert. There is another part of an environment which directly does not expresses itself, but rather by understanding it you can grab certain information and which will help you in making further decisions. This is the overt part of an environment. What do I mean? Take the example of a classroom. Now, the schema of a classroom defines certain objects which are present and certain type of actions which are probable inside the classroom. There would be a teacher present, there would be students and there would be interaction between the teacher and the student and then there are certain kind of learning which is happening. What actions are permitted? In a classroom mostly it will be the delivering of lectures, the asking of questions, the taking of notes and academic discussions which are possible within this environment. So, anybody who enters into the classroom would most probably think of taking these kind of actions and this is what I mean by the social aspect of an environment. So, in definition of environment then consists of the physical aspect, social aspect. There are other aspects also which are part of the environment and these are certain assortment of items that the user uses. What could be these other items in the environment? It could be the way an individual interacts, it could be the way a particular person is uh, behaving or designed to behave. So, other factors also come in into principle and they define an environment. Now, while defining engineering psychology, we should look at not only the design of environments, but also the limits and capabilities of the user. Humans have certain sensory abilities. For example, there are certain capabilities and limitations of the human visual system. One good example here is that humans can see till a distance of 25 meters after which the lines converge and the idea of horizon creeps in. Also, the way the visual system is designed, things which are in the periphery have to be bigger for humans to perceive while things which are in front of the eyes are perceived even if they are smaller and brighter. The periphery of the human eye is lined up by rod cells in the retina which are most receptive to larger sizes but least receptive to 
quick changes. The central focus which is the fovea of the human eye can respond to quick changes and colors and smaller sizes. So, while designing displays or designing cautions, these facts should be kept in mind. In further lectures, we will look at how the visual system and auditory system are made up of and what are the capabilities and limitations of these systems. Also, the cognitive processing of information which the operator is doing should be the focus of study of engineering psychology. What do I mean by this? Let us assume that we put a road sign. Now, the best way to put a road sign is as a symbol. We should be aware as an engineering psychologist that symbols can have multiple meanings. So, before putting any symbols, research should be done as to how these symbols are processed and understood. And this understanding, how does it get translated into further action? Because the way a symbol is perceived and evaluated will decide what kind of action would humans do. And a good example here would be traffic lights. You would have a red and a green light. A red light says no go and a green light says go. And in some traffic interaction intersections, you would also have an orange light. So, what does the orange light actually mean and how different users interpret this orange light should be understood through a survey or experiment and based on that these orange lights should be put in a traffic intersection. Because orange light mostly or yellow light mostly are believed to be expressing drive slow, but is that what it actually means? Also there are certain lights which display a U-turn or a cross U-turn. What does it mean and how do users interpret? If you have taken a driving test, you would be more clear with what I am suggesting here. So, not only how displays or symbols and signs from the environment are processed by humans. The study of engineering psychology should also include how humans are processing it because this will decide what kind of future action or further actions humans are going to take. Further to that, engineering psychology is categorized as an applied field simply because research which is conducted in this field are not only used to understand how accidents occur. Remember the cover story which I used in the beginning of this lecture. It is also used to study and discover ways to prevent accidents. By looking at the precursors to the accident and by understanding the capabilities and limitations of the user and the system, efficient ways could be designed which can prevent accidents. One possible solution to the Orissa train accident that I described in the beginning of this lecture 
could have been an auditory warning system or a tactile warning system which could have set long before the accident and these tactile and auditory systems should be given in addition to the visual warning so that the driver can process this information and take necessary actions to prevent the accidents. So, understanding accidents and designing ways and methods to prevent accidents is another goal of human engineering. What is the emphasis of this field? More generally, human factor engineering has a engineering emphasis. Human factor engineering helps in designing of tools, equipments or processes that functions as users expect them to functions. Objects have affordances. This is a principle of perceptual psychology or the psychology of perception and what it means is that objects provide subtle cues to users as to how to interact with them. Look at the door handle. It is made in such a way that you grab onto it and pull towards your self so that it closes. But if the handle is designed in such a way that you cannot grab and pull it towards you and suppose the door only allows inward movement, how then would you close the door? So, the shape of the handle suggests or gives affordances as to grab it and pull towards you. If the same door would have been used for coming out of a room, it should use some other way or some other design of handle which should give the affordance of pushing onto it. So, this designing of tools, equipments or processes become a central concept or a central requirement of human engineering. By designing tools and environments with the use of knowledge from psychology, operators of machines or individuals who are using uh, machine systems, they can achieve a desired outcome. If the machine is designed in a very efficient way, very intuitive way, it would become very easy to work with a machine than when it is designed poorly. Remember first generation cameras where you had the wheel which made you move forward the film. Now, you kept on doing it till you have all the 36 films being exposed, but then from there on you do not know how to rewind it because there was no rewind button. And if by chance when you have reached the 36th frame and the wheel goes no further, you open the door of the camera where the film is moving, you stand the chance of destroying the whole film. Newer systems or motorized systems were designed which at the end of the film rewinded itself the whole film so that this kind of problem did not exist and people did not accidentally expose the whole film. So, by redesigning the wheel in such a way that either automatically it rewinds or after a point of time at the end of the film 
no matter what you do it will not open the door which encases the film the only function that should be allowed there would be reversing the wheel if you use this small idea most people will then reverse the wheel wind up the whole film and then safely take out the film and get it processed so by making little changes into this whole mechanism a desired objective of getting photographs clicked by the camera can be achieved also human engineering principles can be used for understanding how secondary level machines or secondary level level equipments should be handled let's say i have a pen drive how should i plug it on to the main computer now the design of the computer or system the main machine which you are working with should be in such a way that putting in the pen drive in this computer would only be allowed from the right direction and you are familiar with this because if you try to plug in the pen drive in the wrong direction it will not fit so not only the design of the main system but subsidiary systems can also be done by using the principles of human engineering human factor in, uh, engineering it emphasizes on to the discipline of ergonomics and what does this discipline of ergonomics do it is that discipline that tries to merge engineering sciences and psychology and through this merging the field of ergonomics utilizes the principles of psychology in terms of limits and capabilities of the human operator and the limits and capabilities of the system in terms of the engineering psychology uses these two inputs combine them together so that we have a more efficient human machine interaction so what is the use of using knowledge from psychology and engineering by combining this ergonomics tries to design environments which would reduce fatigue and injury and injury to human operators while working on systems so that we could have a profitable work environment with less number of accidents and less number of errors human errors and human accidents are a major reason or cause for the less profit profitability of industries some of these human errors are consciously done and some are unconsciously done so by just looking at what kind of errors can be possible in a in a human machine system these errors can be controlled for producing a efficient human machine system now there are a number of areas which are related to the engineering psychology discipline we have inputs from computer science as in how should the processing system of 
any industry work, what is the most efficient way and the most optimal way of achieving a desired goal without too many errors. These kind of inputs can be gathered from inputs from the computer science discipline. We could have inputs from the architecture field which will help us design houses and buildings which are used for storing these machines and making the interaction between the humans and machines possible. So, how should the building be? What should be the architecture of the building? So, that a efficient human interaction with machine takes place. Inputs from biological sciences will help us defining the physiological limitations and capabilities of humans as in how much stress can somebody take? How much work can somebody do? What are the possible causes of fatigue and other related information? And from the interdisciplinary field of medicine, we can have inputs in terms of how small and larger injuries and accidents can be addressed so that the operator gets back quickly to work. You often seen cricketers batting and you see physiotherapists running if these cricketers have an injury. So, depending on the nature of the injury, the physiotherapist or the sports doctor who is with these cricketers, they help in addressing these injuries. If it is small, an on-field solution is found, but if it is large, then the player has to be taken to a medical care center where things can be evaluated and he can be treated. So, these inputs are necessary. Also, biomechanics the field of how the mechanical systems of human and the physiological capacities of human, they interact to give you the best possible way of doing a particular job. So, I will stop my lecture today here itself. When we move to the next lecture, we will talk about several other disciplines which are used as a knowledge base for engineering psychology. We will also look at a little bit of history of how this field developed and further on we will look at some future directions of this field of engineering psychology. So, thank you and goodbye.